Hi, I'm Mike Donahue, the director of Troy, and you're listening to Contra Zoom. back and forth about film. I'm your host, Dakota Arsenault. On today's episode, we have a very special interview that I did for the Academy of Death Racers Film Festival. I have been somewhat cursory involved with the festival for the last couple of years doing interviews every year, and it's always been a fantastic time. I love it. They show short films. They do show some feature films, but they specialize in short films. And this year I had the opportunity to interview Mike Donahue, the director of a new short film called Troy. It is a fantastic, heartfelt short um, that I think uh, if you watch it, you're, you're really going to love it. And this interview is a, is a great conversation that I have with Mike. Uh, you still are able to watch this short on the New York Times website. So I'm going to link to that in the show notes. Um, but yeah, if you if you haven't checked out the Academy of Death Racers Film Festival, every year it runs, I think it costs like $6 American to see a ton of short films. This year, they actually had uh, 11 shorts that were shortlisted. Or the Oscars, and I think two or three of the movies that ended up playing actually ended up getting nominated for Oscars, which is huge, and so a huge congratulations to the whole AODR uh, crew that puts on this fantastic event every year, and, uh, and and knowing that they are pulling in really great films and really great filmmakers, and Troy is no exception, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to throw to our conversation that I had with Mike a few weeks ago, and uh, and for you to, to listen to and enjoy, and please check out the film as well. So here you go. Hi, I'm Dakota Arsenault, host of the ContraZoom podcast. Today I am joined by Mike Donahue, the director of the new short film Troy, playing at this year's Academy of Death Racers Film Festival. The film revolves around a couple, Thea and Charlie, who have paper-thin walls in their New York apartment. All day and night, they hear their next-door neighbor having incredibly loud and passionate sex. This continues until the man next door ends up breaking up with his boyfriend, who is not the person he was having sex with, creating a new set of sounds, namely crying, for Thea and Charlie to deal with. The film is as much about their mysterious loud neighbor's relationships as it is about their own. Mike has a background in theater, and Troy is his debut film. Thank you for joining me today. How are you doing, Mike? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to talk to you. Excellent. This was a hilarious and heartfelt film. I think it kind of hit like all the points that you want in, in a 15 minute movie of that you want to feel all these emotions. So it was terrific to uh, to see this from such a strong debut feature. Thank or, you. I, I really appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, I noticed on one of your Instagram posts that you had mentioned how this movie came about because three years ago, you, Dane Laffrey, and Jen Silverman had an idea for a short with Jen writing the screenplay. And during COVID, you were unable to continue your work in the theater. So you decided to make the film. Can you talk a bit about how you went from the idea stages to deciding to make the actual film? Yeah, I mean, I've been a theater director for the last 12 years, and most of the work I do is new play work, developing and world premieres. And so many of the writers that I loved working with have all left the theater to go write for TV and film. And so before the pandemic, I'd already been thinking that I wanted to try to figure out how to pivot. And we were all in Sydney for a month and a half um, for a couple of projects. And we came up with this idea and got really excited about it and spent a day on the beach, like storyboarding it together. And then Jen wrote the script. And then I promptly went back into theater work. And there was never enough time to actually like figure out how to produce and get made my first short film. Um, and then when our entire industry just like collapsed during the pandemic, um, I, I think I finally had like no more excuses to put off figuring out this like really scary big thing. And so um, I like just started asking for a lot of help from friends who had made shorts and done it before um, and started to figure out it on our own. And then like very fortuitously, 
got connected with a friend of ours that we knew as an actor, but is also an incredible producer. And he sort of stepped in as the producer for the short. And that was like the, the moment we started working with Evan was the moment that all of this like actually became possible. Um, and then we, we shot the film for four days during the pandemic. It was like right in the fall of 2021 in New York as like all the non-union stuff was going back into production. Um, and we filmed up, up in Washington Heights. Nice. Okay. Well, that was something I also wanted to talk about. You know, I mentioned that you came from theater. Was it always your intention to eventually work in film or was it purely a happy accident? Oh gosh. I, uh, you know, I, I grew up loving movies. Um, like my, my parents were divorced and my dad lived in Orlando and we spent all this time at the theme parks and I, you know, was like obsessed with all of like the behind the scenes, like here's the like show about the Foley. Here's the ride that takes you into the making of like, I loved that stuff. Um, but I think as a kid, like mostly growing up in St. Louis with my family, like the idea of working in film and TV felt so remote and inaccessible that I, I don't know that I ever like thought to think I could actually do that. Um, and theater was the thing that was like immediately available to me. Um, and I loved it. So I, for so long, that's what I did and what I thought I wanted to do. And then, um, I don't know, after like a decade, I started to get hungry for new challenges and like new ways of working. And so that, that is where a lot of this impulse came from. Nice. I'm always sort of curious about the craft of directing. And I want to know, did you face any challenges directing that you hadn't experienced before in theater? And then on the flip side, were there any things that when you got to set, you realized you absolutely knew how to handle? Yeah, I, one of my favorite parts of my job is working with actors. And we wrote this very specifically for these actors. They're all folks that we've worked with in like downtown New York theater. They're all folks who are really smart about tone. Um, and when I got to set, I, I actually discovered it's so much fun to work with people because you're only working in these like really digestible, small little bites. And you just have to like capture that lightning in a bottle that one time. And then you can throw that moment away and never have to worry about it. And like, you know, we're in the middle of our third week of rehearsals for a show in Chicago right now. And we're in the part of the process where like we're having to remember what we were thinking about two weeks ago when we first did something that made it kind of like exciting and feel spontaneous and fresh and impulsive. And all those impulses are like long since gone and dead. And we have to do this detective work to figure out how to get that back and what framework needs to be in place to do it and how to fake it if you're not feeling it. And like all all of that, which is incredibly interesting um, and, and like fun and challenging. You don't have to do any of that. Uh, <laughs> on set. And that, that was incredibly liberating <laughs> to get to just like work on a moment and then move on to the next and not have to worry about um, being able to play that again in two months. Yeah. It's, it's a bit of a different beast in that sense, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Uh, I feel like, this was the year of the short film, you know, because you had Wes Anderson who dropped four Roll Doll shorts and Pedro Almodovar did The Strange Way of Life. And I grouped them together because they both had some seriously stacked casts. And I would include Troy in this category. You've got Adina Version and Michael Braun, who stars the main couple, and both have some very high profile film credits to their name. But then sneaking in for quick appearances, you have legendary actors Dylan Baker and Dana Delaney. Can you talk a bit about the casting of the film? A seriously impressive feat for a debut. I, they're all just friends that we've worked with before. So Dana and Adina together did a play of Jens that I directed the premiere of back in 2018. Um, we're in Chicago right now doing a play with Dana that is, Dana's a creator on. It's about a relationship that happened in Dana's actual life. Dylan Baker was one of the first directors I ever assisted when I got out of grad school. Um, and he's been such an incredible mentor and supporter and has always come in and done readings for me. So when we wrote this, we wrote this small part for him thinking maybe he'll be free and he'll want to come join us. And then, you know, no one was working because it was the pandemic. So we actually got all of these extraordinary actors that we wrote, you know, these like one-off scenes for hoping that maybe we'd be able to figure it out. So I, I think we just got really lucky. Yeah. And, and the chemistry that everyone has feels so realistic. And and I love the way everyone played off each other. And and I, I sort of assumed, I was like, I wonder if this is uh, Mike, you know, calling in all of his theater connections and everyone's already worked together before and that sort of thing. And so it's nice to hear that that is the case. It, yeah, it's a lot of that. <laughs> hey, when, when you're making films, you got to call in all the favors you can. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> 
Uh, a main part of the plot line is that we hear very loud sex that is completely distracting the lives of Thea and Charlie. I suppose my question is twofold. First, were those new and unique moans we hear or audio found? And secondly, uh, I know with the art of movie making, you often don't hear things on set as it's added in post. But were there any time that the actors were on set hearing the moans for you to get some genuine reactions? Uh it's all stuff that we recorded um, through a kind of insane process. Like we, you know, cause the offstage sound is, is like a huge character in the movie. Um, and when we were filming this, most of the time it was me talking through with the actors, what the beats were that they were hearing next door and how they would respond to that. And then I would cue them visually for a lot of it, or we would just set timing for it. I think there was like one scene where our AD had to make some noise and that is actually in the film because it was like so good, we couldn't invest it as we were recording stuff. Um, but for the most part, we had to edit it with temp tracks because it, it sort of determines the pacing and also the tone of the film. Um, and so I, I spent two days <laughs> watching like a lot of gay porn online and ripping the audio from it and then breaking it down into like 30 to 60 second clips and then cataloging it into things like high pitched porpoise before orgasm, high pitched porpoise at the peak of orgasm, Gatling gun, like rapid fire guttural, like all that kind of stuff so that the editor and I could use those as temp tracks. And that once we had kind of set the score for the film, some of which, you know, we kind of knew when we wrote the piece and some of which we had to figure out in the editing booth. Um, we then had a very weird day of filming where we got our actor who plays Troy, who is also like a very well-known gay porn star um, and our producer, who's an actor and a friend. And the three of them came in and we spent like five hours um basically recreating all of our temp tracks so that it was material that we had actually made. Um, and it's wild because we had to get really specific about like who's the client in this moment and like what are the power dynamics about that and like what is the actual physical action that's happening because that actually affects the rhythms of the sound and like what the ad libs are. And so, you know, it was a, a really strange day of um, ADR work. <laughs> I, I bet it was. Uh, how, how much was Florian inputting who plays Troy as far as like, this is the kind of noise that you need to make to sound it realistic? <laughs> uh, a, a lot. I mean, I guess the thing about it is like this guy has such like insanely loud, voracious sex. And sometimes it's like performative on purpose. And sometimes it's like mind blowing and you can't help it. And so there's also like all the different reasons that it is as loud as it is. But I think part of it is that this, this guy who's their neighbor is just somebody who lives life in such extremes. And like the highs are really high and the lows are really low, like the depths of his despair and his profound sadness, like those are also really like bold and loud and colorful. And it's so much of that is, is kind of the lesson that Taya and Charlie are learning from him, which is, you know, to live life more joyously and, and to live it more loudly. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that was a big part of it with scoring it with Florian also. <laughs> nice. Now, I feel like the experience of having a neighbor or roommate um, who they themselves or maybe have partners who are very loud is a common experience. I, I personally once had a roommate who had a girlfriend for a bit that me and my own partner dubbed as uh, the screamer. Did you, uh, any combination of you, Dane or Jen, have a real life inspiration for Troy's loud antics? Yeah, it's a, there's a kernel of real life in the sort of the the like setup of the short, <laughs> but um, so much of how the the couple kind of like attaches to and goes down the rabbit hole of this guy's life and how learning about him and connecting to him and finding empathy for him and curiosity for him, how that actually changes their own relationship. All of that, you know, is sort of like stuff that we came up with. Fair enough. Um, after Troy is, is dumped by his boyfriend, instead of loud modes, he turns to crying. At one point, is heard singing Angel by Sarah McLaughlin. Was it just a matter of picking out both the saddest and funniest song possible? And how did you get the rights for that song? Uh, we got lucky. We asked Sony and they said, sure. And we just had to pay for them and we got them. Um, I think we had to tell them, like, how, how, tell them how we were going to use the song. I don't know. That, that song is, like, I, such a part of my childhood because of the commercials yes um and and it, it manages to walk that line so brilliantly like that song is like 
profoundly emotionally visceral um, and evocative. Um, and yet it has also been used in all of these other, you know, sort of like insane permutations. So it, it did that, that particular song was like written into the script. That was the idea always. Nice. So you got lucky a bit there with that one. You got really lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to explain too much about like, oh, well, originally this person is uh, having loud sex. And then after he gets broken up, he's singing this song and they were, Sony was no, all. I don't, I don't think we told Sony all of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully Sarah McLaughlin ends up seeing this one day. It was like, oh, that's my song. <laughs> he's so lucky. <laughs> Adopt a dog, uh, breakup music. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Mike, on behalf of the Academy of Death Racers Film Festival, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today. Can you share what is next for, for you and for the film? And if people want to learn about more about Troy the movie, what's the best place to go? Sure, yeah. So uh, we're actually, we were acquired by The New Yorker and we're uh, hosted on their platform in their screening rooms. So uh, there's a wonderful write-up on the film and you can watch the film on The New Yorker. We're also on their Vimeo uh, and YouTube channels and uh, next up, Jen and Dane and I are working on the feature version of Troy, uh, and Jen and I are working on another feature that we had we uh, that we actually wrote like two years ago, and was uh, we're like in the process of trying to attach actors to it right now. So that's uh, that's next up is trying to trying to get a feature made. Wow, that's very exciting! I'm very happy to hear that because I think it's one that uh, a lot of audiences will really resonate with too. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Mike. Thank you. Thanks so much for talking. So once again, I want to thank Mike Donahue for his time uh, and chatting with me. It was a really fun conversation. Uh, I, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did having the conversation with him. Uh, so check out the show notes. I'm going to have links for where you can find more information about the film and especially about the Academy of Death Racers Film Festival. So make sure you check out AODR.net to learn more about the festival, more about what they're doing there. Uh, and if you weren't checking out films this year or the past few years, you got to do it next year. It's a fantastic film festival run by some really passionate people. So a huge thank you to to everyone over there that, uh, that helped set this interview up. And of course, uh, Mike as well. This has been a That Shelf podcast. Visit thatshelf.com for more great film discourse. Follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and threads at ContraZoomPod. Uh, did you see anything at the AODR Festival? Did you watch Troy? Please let me know. Send an email to ContraZoomPod at gmail.com. Thank you to Eric and Kevin Smell for the theme music and Stephanie Pryor for the logo design. If you like to listen to podcasts, we do post all episodes on YouTube as well. And if you really like the show, consider tipping us on coffee. Thanks for checking us out. Mm -hmm.